Good morning and welcome to Messiah Worship Online. We are so glad that you have decided to join us this day as we gather uh, online to give thanks and praise to our God and to bless God's holy name. We are so glad that you are here, and especially if you happen to have found us uh, through our online worship services. We would like to get to know you better, so please do use the contact uh, page on our website to reach out to us. Make sure that you sign up for our e-newsletter as well. And uh, again, we want to remind you that we are here for you. So Aaron Kampschneider, our Director of Faith Formation, and I are available if you just need someone to talk to. If you have questions or concerns, please do, please do reach out to us. And we want to say a word of uh, Happy Father's Day to all the fathers who are worshiping with us today. Today is a day that we celebrate that God has called you to this very special ministry of being a parent and sharing God's love with your children. So we pray that you are blessed this day and that you are reminded of what a gift God has given you as a parent and the gift of your children. So happy Father's Day. Again, uh, if you happen to be watching this and you are finished by 9.45, you are invited to join us for the Donut to Be Afraid Fellowship time. That is a Zoom meeting at 9.45 on Sunday mornings. The uh, ID information for the meeting is in the e-newsletter. Come and join us. It's just like sitting around a table in the fellowship hall between services. You do have to bring your own donut and coffee, but it's a chance to just chat and, and catch up with some of your Messiah family. So we hope that you will join us for that. Again, I remind you that it is so important that we continue to pray for one another, especially in this time that we are separated from one another. So use the prayer list that is provided for you in the e-newsletter. Uh, use that. We update it weekly. In particular, we would ask you to please be praying for the family of Helen Hunt. Helen passed away this last week. The celebration of resurrection and life for Helen was held yesterday at Bethany Funeral Home. So please be praying for Stan and Linda and Amy and, and all of Helen's family and for her friends. We would also ask you to pray for the family of Judy Malroy. Uh, Judy was the founder of Arts for All, and of course we are one of their uh, host sites for those classes. It was her vision of providing uh, the arts and educating children in the arts that led to that. I understand that now it reaches over 4,000 children in the Omaha area. So we pray for her and for her family. Psalm 69 is a sign for today, and Psalm 6, uh, verse 16 says this, Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. That is our plea this day, as we worship our God, that God will indeed show us his kind love and turn toward us in compassion. And so we begin our worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. Let's take a brief time for reflection. Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us where we have gone wrong and sinned, and help us to walk in your way. Amen. May the God of love and power bring you back to himself, forgive you and free you from your sins, and restore you to newness of life by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I 
Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age, till earth and sky and ocean ring with joy, with justice, love, and praise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading is from Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. Jeremiah accuses God of forcing him into a ministry that brings him only contempt and persecution. Yet Jeremiah is confident that God will be a strong protector and commits his life into God's hands. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around, denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him, and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your rep retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord. For he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. In baptism, we were incorporated into the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. We have been made new in Christ through his death and resurrection to live free from sin. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so that we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also must consider yourselves death, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus continues teaching his disciples by saying, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. 
What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who killed the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground unperceived by your Father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, for I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Fear. As uh, New Testament professor Stanley Saunders asked, is there any more pervasive or powerful force in the human experience? From the day we are born, we learn to fear things that are outside us. We learn soon to fear the stranger. And we seem to innately fear those who are different from us. Sometimes, unfortunately, we even find ourselves fearing those who are closest to us. Fear is not evil in of itself, and it is not to be entirely avoided. You know, like right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Are we not to be at least a little afraid? If not for ourselves, then for the others, those who are vulnerable? Is it not fear that causes us to take precautions? Does wearing a seatbelt mean that you are afraid? Or putting on sunscreen? Or wearing a mask? Is that not healthy fear? We find ourselves not only in the middle of a pandemic, but also in the middle of, of great civil unrest that harkens back to the civil rights mo movement of some 50 years ago. Does not fear play a part in that as well? Are there not those who are in positions of power and privilege who are afraid of losing that power and privilege? There are people of color who say that they are afraid for their lives and for the lives of their children. They don't want to live in fear, and so they cry out. Political leaders, well, you know, they have long recognized the power of fear, and they use it to enforce their particular worldviews and structures, and not to serve us and our best interest, but their own. Vast Segments of our economy are based on fear. We buy and invest because of fear. Fear of the future, our fear of what might happen. We are taught and, and we learn that we should be afraid of growing old or of not being pretty enough or smart enough. And there is always somebody out there who is ready and willing to capitalize upon those fears, small and large, for the sake of profit. Power is only more than happy to manipulate the other. 
with fear. Fear. It is a powerful, powerful force. We can even become addicted to it. Where I see this most often is in watching the news and the media reports. It seems that we just can't get enough of those events that cause us to be afraid, can we? We're just craving that next high of terrible news. Scientists say that there's a reason for that. There's a chemical uh, dependency that we create. We are addicted to the stress hormone of cortisol. It's just like the more we know, the more afraid we can be. And of course, there are those out there who are only too happy to feed our addiction by sensationalizing and highlighting and even manufacturing horrible events for us to be afraid of. Fear. And then there becomes the fear of fear. And and it all just cripples us and paralyzes us and and emotionally tears us down and divides us when, when we need not be divided. In our Gospel lesson, Jesus also recognizes the power of fear and he knows that it can cause a failure in discipleship. His disciples have courageously left uh, their family, their vocation, their homes to follow him and to go and to proclaim that the presence of God has come near to all people. And I'm sure that in doing that, there was a certain amount of fear in the decisions that they made. But you see, Jesus knows that that's that's just the beginning. He knows that they are going to be confronted and tempted to bow to some very powerful fear. Because it seems that proclaiming radical love, mercy, and forgiveness will put you on a collision course with the powers of this world. And so, Jesus prepares his followers. First, by being starkly realistic about what they are going to face. But then also, he presents to them the very essence of why they should not let this fear master them or hinder their mission. In what seems to be counterintuitive, Jesus denies them as they go out, and this is in the verses prior to what I just read today, but he sends them out denying them money or pay, even extra clothes, a staff for protection, or even a a spare pair of sandals. Instead, he calls them to undertake this mission in complete vulnerability and dependence upon God, even when faced with hatred and persecution, arrest, beatings, and opposition from family. After all, Jesus points out, why would they expect any less than what happens to the Master? In our gospel, Jesus is pulling no punches. He names aloud the things that they will endure and that could place them in the grip of fear. But wound in that, in those worst-case scenarios, are his statements of reassurance and calls to resist the fear. Literally, he says, do not be afraid. He says, don't be afraid because you are proclaiming the reality of God's presence. You are doing it in the light. You're shouting it from the housetops. And you're doing it in the face of the world's claims that the world has real power. Make no mistake, the threats that can cause fear are very real. It includes even the threat of death. 
However, Jesus points out that even though those powers of the world can go to the point of killing, God alone is the only one who can destroy both soul and body. God alone, therefore, is the only one that we should fear. But, as true as that is, Jesus also reassures his disciples that God is not, in fact, acting like the powers of the world. God does not rule with power and fear. But instead, God's power is revealed in love and care. Even for the insignificant sparrow. And Jesus says, you're worth so much more than those, and yet God cares even for them. And Jesus says, God cares more about you than you can care for yourself. Is there anybody here who knows how many hairs are on the top of your head? God does. So, as we hear these words of Jesus, to not be afraid, even confronted by very real fears and the powers that can, can grip us, we need to ask ourselves, what fear is crippling your ability to follow Jesus and to live in love and mercy? What causes hate and anger to stir up in you? Because those come from fear. So what fear holds a power over you? Is it death? Are you afraid of losing your perceived identity? because you have wrapped that identity up in the things of the world, whether it's your politics, your status, your financial well-being, are you afraid of, of losing your family? You see, your identity as a child of God renders all other claims upon you and their allegiance, even to father, mother, son, daughter, as secondary. So, taking up your cross is to align yourself not with the powers of the world, whatever they may be, but instead, taking up your cross is to align yourself with the one who went to the humiliated, the suffering, and the shamed, and went to the cross for their sake and for your sake and faced even death so that you don't need to be afraid. For not even death can hold us or separate us from the love of God. It means that we align ourselves even in opposition to that death to the promises that Jesus gives us. Jesus says, those who lose their life, that is, those who are willing to, to let go of all of the things that try to grip them in fear and follow me, those who lose their life, let go of that, will in fact find life. That's where you'll find your identity, your purpose and meaning. And he says, those who are trying to find their lives out in the world by grabbing a hold of what they think is powerful, those things that they think will give them security and might and influence, he says, well, all those alluring traps will fall away and you'll lose life. Do not be afraid. For now... Now is the time for us to step into the darknesses around us. Darknesses that attempt to, hold, attempt to hold us captive to fear and to false power. 
It means stepping into the darkness of a disease that, that takes life and especially the lives of the vulnerable. And we do that by staying away from each other. It's about stepping into the darkness of personal and systemic racism and bias and speaking the truth that all are God's people and all people are to be valued and to be given voice and opportunity and treated with respect and dignity. It's about stepping into the darkness of a deteriorating world that needs restoration, that needs stewards who see the world as a gift from God, not as a resource to be exploited. It's stepping into the personal darknesses of those around you who are anxious and afraid, those who are lonely and lost, and speaking the truth of God's presence for them. Now, I know that these challenges can, can seem daunting, and we might even be <laughs> afraid of them, and they might make us uncomfortable. But folks, we cannot align ourselves with the powers of this world that control by fear. We can be fearless in making ourselves vulnerable to one another by listening to one another, confessing and understanding without condemnation or fear that somehow if we do that, we might lose something. We might become less than. Because we can't. We can be fearless in speaking truth in the fa face of powers that threaten. You see, the answer to fear is to call out the facades of human power. To be able to say, that has no control over me. You do not have power over me. Because what's the worst that can happen? They can threaten you with death. And where is the sting of death? It is gone in the victory of Jesus Christ. And so instead, we can live in this deep awareness and conviction that God is present God is present with us and in this world, not in fear, but in our love and mercy and compassion. And that is what the world needs now more than ever. Do not be afraid. Amen. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, one day while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for you're our joy and prize. To see the captive's hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor in peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church.
unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Tell us with the strength. your church we are the hope on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire when this day We confess our faith together, the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Expansive God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. We think especially of our sisters and brothers of Inkukati, Gethsemane, and South Sudan parishes. Open our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another that differences might not overshadow our baptismal unity. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Providing God, your creation shows us that life comes from death. Renew the places where our land, air, and waterways have been ill for too long. Direct the work of all who care for birds and their habitats. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Protecting God, sustain and keep safe all who work to defend others across the world. Revive and strengthen organizations dedicated to caring for refugees and migrants while their homelands struggle for peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you promise to be with all who are persecuted for your sake. Guide all who speak your word of justice and console any who are tormented or targeted for being who they are. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you bring healing and life to all who are sick, suffering, and dying. Keep us safe in the pandemic Bring your presence to all in need this day, and especially those we name before you now. Strengthen caregivers and inspire researchers. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you are with us and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers and all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in the faith. We give you thanks for those who have died. Increase our care for one another 
until we walk with them in the newness of life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Being made one by the power of the Spirit, let us pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Be sure to share that peace of Christ with all those whom you meet this day. As we continue to worship, we also give of what God has first given us. That is, our life, our time, our talents, and our resources. For in this, we boldly proclaim that God's sovereignty is in our lives. We want to say that we are so grateful for your offerings and your continued support of our Messiah ministries. God is at work through your generosity. Thank you. And as we come to worship, we also remember that Christ has come to us in his holy meal to assure us and nurture us with his gifts of presence, love, and forgiveness. And so we do encourage you to continue to celebrate the Lord's Supper using the liturgies that are provided for you in Holy Communion during separation on our website. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you always, now and forever. Amen. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me brings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me. Is my father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king, let heaven ring. Let earth be glad. Go in peace. God is with us. Thanks be to God. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King. Let heaven ring. God reigns. Let earth be glad.